Well, good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome, whether you are joining us online or here in Prince Philip House. For those of you that haven't met me before, my name's Hayat and Sillam, and I'm the Chief Executive here at the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering Foundation. And it's my absolute pleasure to be hosting tonight's discussion on the question of, can technology be society's great equaliser? Before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping notices for those joining in the room. We do not have any scheduled fire drills, so if you do hear an alarm, please follow the Academy staff who will make themselves known to you, and there are exits either side of the building. I would also ask you to just turn those phones to silent, please. We are live, this is being recorded, and um, do feel free throughout the evening to share reflections on social using the hashtag or Twitter handle RANNews. So this really is a question for our times. Can technology be society's great equaliser? You can't move for headlines and content and opinion pieces talking about the impact that technology is having on the way that we live, work, interact, and on what the future for all of us might look like. There's a lot of hyperbole. There's an understandable anxiety and I think for many people, a sense that this is something beyond their control. But does that need to be the case? Well, I'm going to introduce in a minute three outstanding speakers who are just the people to help us navigate this really important and thorny question. But I do want to also say that this is not a question that can be responded to with a singular answer. This is a topic that we need to discuss and look at from a whole range of angles. So I'm so thrilled that we've got a really brilliant audience both in the room here and online. And I'm looking forward to hearing what you will think. So we will be using Slido throughout the event. There should be a QR code visible to you either now or very shortly. And um, hopefully you will know how to access Slido. We'll be using that for people in the room as well as online. But also if you're in the room, we'll have a microphone and I'd love to hear your comments as well as your questions. This is definitely something where audience participation is going to be required. I'm just warning you in advance. <laughs> Brilliant. So it's now my absolute pleasure to introduce three people who I never fail to be inspired by. And they're going to share their thoughts on whether technology can help us achieve a more inclusive and more equal future. Why it might not and what challenges we're going to have to address if we want to maximise the positive benefit to society. First up, we'll have Jackie Wright, who is McKinsey's first Chief Technology and Platform Officer, former Corporate Vice President and Chief Digital Officer at Microsoft, and last year named the UK's most influential black person in the 2022 Power List. Professor Sue Black, OBE, is a multi-award winning computer scientist, technology evangelist and digital skills expert. She is Professor of Computer Science at Durham University and was responsible for setting up the UK's first online network for women in 1998 and leading the campaign to save Bletchley Park, home of the World War II codebreakers. Florian Fidenon Edo is an innovation consultant at BMNT and before this headed up the industry technology and innovation team at public policy think tank Policy Connect. She founded and led the Warwick Women's Engineering Society, is a Royal Academy of Engineering Leader Scholar and Chairperson of the Stemets Futures Youth Board. We have three fantastic experts joining me on stage. Please welcome them. Thank you. Brilliant. So I think we should start with a personal perspective from each of you about your thoughts on this question and particularly how it relates to your own experience. So, Jackie, I'm going to start with you. If, if you try it, let's see if it works. And if not. Hello. Hello. Can you hear yes. me? Yeah. All right. Well, over to you, Jackie. Thank you for having me. I, you know, I think it's a really interesting topic, interesting times. And I'm, while I'm sure everyone wants to talk about AI, um, I think it's, it's appropriate <laughs> that we talk about the bigger opportunities that we have to, with technology. And so just a few thoughts, and, and Sue and Florian can add on this. When you think about what equalizing really means, it really is about inequities, removing inequities, creating, removing the barriers for access to education, healthcare, you name it. And you know, just a few examples, if you think about in the healthcare space, 
what we had during COVID and with tele telemedicine, telehealth, how that removed the barriers so that folks could actually get healthcare no matter where they are. If you think about the infrastructure, um, rolling out broadband, more broadly, rural locations, what does that do to really enable folks to be able to get access to everything? Adaptive learning for, tech, for, for learning for those with disabilities. What does that do? That removes the barrier of entry for folks to participate in the economy and work. Renewable energy. What are we doing with net zero and how we're enabling through technology? Precision agriculture, crop yield. I mean, there's just so many things when we think about technology as an equalizer and what it does for the existential, existential things that we have in society to solve. Well, I'm excited about what we can do and we can talk about more about the risks associated with that afterwards. So over Brilliant. to you, Sue. Thanks. Nice positive note to start on. That's right. Yes, Sue. Thank you. Um, so technology and education just completely changed my life from where I was when I was 16 through to now, I think I never would have dreamed that I'd end up being on this stage here uh, tonight. So, you know, I come from, I guess, like a sort of dysfunctional family. I had to leave home at 16 and leave school. Um, and then uh, I ended up at, well, at 23, I had three small children. I was married and ended up in a women's refuge, was in there for six months, then came out of there and went back into education at the age of 26. So like 10 years out of the education system. And I always loved maths at school, so I went to, to college and did a kind of night course in, in maths at Southwark College down the road, and then went on and did a degree in computing, then stayed on, did a PhD in software engineering, and became an academic, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Several years later, you know, here I am with, uh, you know, being a professor of computing at Durham and having had a, a successful career. Um, and so, you know, technology and education have just dramatically changed my life so much. You know, if I hadn't had access to that education, that maths course, if I hadn't been able to go to uni, you know, I got a grant to go to university. If I hadn't been able to do all of those things, I would be, you know, I would have been working in a supermarket, probably on the checkout for seven pounds an hour or something back then. And I just wouldn't have been able to do all the things that I've done. And there are so many people in that sort of position who could be getting out there, who could be working in, in technology. Um, and so some of the things that I've done over the years, like setting up uh, BCS Women, like you said. So as um, a PhD student, when I was in my 20s, um, I was going to conferences, like academic computer science conferences, which were mainly men. And I hadn't realized that I was a woman in computing. I just thought I was a computer scientist. And uh, my supervisor said to me, you've got to network when you go to conferences. And I was ridiculously shy. So that's the, like, the last thing I wanted to do at conferences. But I tried. And sometimes it was fine. And other times it was pretty horrific and very embarrassing because people got the wrong idea. And then I went to this Women in STEM uh, conference in Brussels in 1998. And it was all women at the conference. And it's the first time that I kind of realized how if you're in the majority, life is just easier. And, you know, there I was in a majority. We were all women. We all love technology, all love STEM. And it, that was like party time for like with me and like 99 other women, which was so different to my experience at the sort of academic computer science conferences. So I came back from that and set up BCS Women because I thought I need to connect together all the other women in tech that, that want to just chat to each other about technology. Um, and then from there, I set up Tech Moms, a social enterprise to teach mums, particularly living in disadvantaged areas, some tech skills to help them set up their own business, get back into education, get a job, uh, which has been really successful. And then our program at Durham Tech Up Women, which is retraining women from underserved communities into tech careers, working with industry partners. So putting together courses which will take uh, women through a program, mainly online, but with some residential meetups through to um, specific jobs that the industry tell us that they want. I'll stop there, otherwise I'll go on forever. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's great. And actually, you know, you're brilliantly combining there the personal with some really practical things that, that help to make that potential possible. Um, Florian, please do share your perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are kind of three key areas I see where technology can be an equaliser. The first is in how we materially live our lives and the impact of the technology. So some of the, the ones that Jackie has referred to, but also kind of um, internet of things and how we operate and interact with technology in our house. Um, but also kind of data skills, how we teach um, 
particularly not just digital skills, but teach in general, um, that's becoming a lot easier. Post pandemic, we're talking about modular teaching and being able to do that online. Um, so how we interact with um, technology materially, I think can be a massive equaliser. It can provide accessibility to people who didn't have them, who didn't have it in the first place, but it also provides us an opportunity to remove some of the kind of burden of life and getting through things. It, um, I imagine people who had to do laundry without washing machines spent a lot more time doing laundry than we do now. Um, and it's that kind of onward impact that we'll probably see in the next couple of years. I think the second area that's really interesting for me is that kind of automation and future of work. So as technology removes some of the mundane, more dangerous jobs that we um, have in our sectors, particularly in manufacturing, so that's where I'm from, but in, in pretty much every sector, there's an opportunity here for us to reskill and change the way in which we see value and perceive value that humans generate. Um, and rather than doing those kind of monotonous, monotonous mundane tasks, we're freeing up people to reskill and to, to build value in the things that humans are good at. So whether that's creativity or critical thinking, the ability to have empathy, these are things that machines and technology can't replicate and probably never will. Sorry, data scientists and, and <laughs> AI engineers. Um, and I think the third really important one is how um, technology can be democratised and also how technology allows us to embed democracy in our society um, and I always look to kind of three really key players like Marie Coppany who's been doing loads of work for pretty much all her life in Flint um, and has been using social me media to galvanise that movement. Greta Thunberg, Manala Yousafzai, these are all young women who potentially would not have had access to the network of people without technology to spread their message to galvanise people in the way that they have um, and I think what's really concerning and obviously with the drama around various social media platforms is who owns those platforms, who owns those channels in which we facilitate those conversations um, and how are they able to have or make significant decisions around um, the kind of democratic groups that are pulling together across social media, across those, across those platforms. So for me, there's um, a massive question around how we democratise the use of technology and that comes all the way from kind of digital divide and people having access to actually the people who make decisions about those platforms, how they're operating, where they use their guidelines. Um, and so all of that is massively caveated with ethical practices, um, recognising that actually if we're not focused on society's greatest challenges like net zero and social inequity, we're never going to fully harness the opportunities that technology has to offer us. Um, so those are kind of three key areas that I'm particularly interested in, but would be really excited to hear what you guys think and we'll see what the audience think. Great. Um, brilliant framing. Uh, please do prepare your thoughts. I'm going to come to you quite shortly, but I've got a few more questions I've got to just pick up with the panel before we open up um, for, for wider inputs. I mean, one thing I'm really conscious of is we're sitting here as a panel of people with what, what I would call very high technological capital. We're all people that feel confident around technology. We understand how to navigate it. Do you think that, that our you know, the overwhelming optimism that sort of come through in those opening remarks reflects that. And does this worry you? I mean, I, but Jackie, did you want to come in first? I, yeah. I OK, all right. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is how it's going to work. <laughs> well, I think you're still maybe commenting because you've, you've lived this journey yourself. Yeah. I mean, there's something like 40 million people in the UK with very low digital engagement. And then a large number beyond that who I would say certainly are digitally confident. What's your reflection on... How we, how we make sure that technology is the great equaliser for all of society, not the subset of us who are already digitally empowered. Well, I guess that's how Tech Mums came about, my social enterprise. So it was about 10 years ago and um, the Bletchley Park campaign had just finished. So I don't know why, but I've kind of got this campaigning, uh, <laughs> I don't know, part of my personality. Um, and uh, I guess I was looking for something else to do apart from working full, full time and having four children. And, um, <laughs> And um, I was getting really fed up with the way that often in the media, and still now really, technology is seen as a negative thing rather than a positive thing. You know, it's like kind of the robots are going to kill us all or take away our jobs or whatever. Um, whereas to me, you know, it's changed my life and I just see the potential of it to, you know, in a very short space of time, change so many people's lives. And I started running uh, workshops with seven-year-old kids in primary school. So at that time there was no like programming or anything in schools. And, um, and ran the workshops with them. So they're doing like app design and coding on uh, Raspberry Pis in Python and enjoying that. And we get the parents in at the end of the day. 
and um, and I would you know say okay you know like mums and dads have a go at what your kids have been doing they'll show you what they've been doing and I kind of noticed that when I looked around the room in general the dads were just kind of like stepping in okay like what do you want me to do and there was kind of a look of a bit of horror on some of the mums faces and just that kind of split second I just thought why don't I put together a program to teach mums tech skills because we kind of like we disempower women in general I think around sort of technical stuff just in our society like we all do without even thinking and that that's kind of historically kind of just what we've done um, and so why don't yeah I put a program together to empower mums with technology teach them some tech skills and if I can do that with them then it'll also influence the kids so we kind of get everyone more interested and excited about technology um, and so just put a program together which is you know like basic uh, app design um, web design social media and like really basic so just kind of like here are a few of the buzzwords that you might have heard of like HTML or something which if you're completely outside the area you have no clue what that is so just kind of explaining some very basic stuff getting the mums to do um, just a little bit of HTML like make something bold or something and then uh, do some drag and drop use Squarespace or Wix or something you know and you've got in two hours you've got mums designing their own websites just absolutely amazed that they can do that so there's so much potential to be able to do that with so many people you know and the whole program back then was 10 hours two hours a week for yeah. five weeks and the, the last week is one I loved which they were scared of which was programming in Python and it's just so wonderful to see you know a load of mums from all different backgrounds on, on a council estate in Tower Hamlets having a go at programming in Python mm -hmm. and just getting them to write a print statement basically and change it and then they were like oh my god I can do it you know I changed it from hello world to hello you know like Highton or something and you know like that is so empowering for people I think a lot of time we don't realize I think um, Sue illustrates the point which is about how do you create a systemic approach to leveling up reskilling mm -hmm. and making sure the curricula is fit for purpose mm -hmm. I mean it all centers around all of that because to your point you know you have those who are in disadvantaged communities who want are not getting access, not getting education that's fit for purpose. And people like Sue are spending the time filling that gap. Mm -hmm. And I think if, as we think more about, to your point, how do we create this in a way that's systemic? Mm -hmm. I, think that, I think that's the root cause of, of, of the things we need to really resolve. Yeah, and I, I think if we ever needed encouragement that actually upskilling is something that all of society can embrace, we of course have the, um, the pandemic still in, in recent memory and one of my particular personal memories of that time was our then eight-year-old daughter teaching our um, teaching my dad who was in his mid-80s how to use Zoom over Zoom during the middle of the pandemic and um, that's a rather trivial example but we have seen the sort of we did a, a decade's worth of digital adoption and digital upskilling in the course of a few months as a result of having no other choice but it doesn't necessarily feel like we've kind of bottled that and managed to still utilise that in peacetime. I mean, Florian, you're also very passionate about this area. Any, any thoughts on how do we make this a, um, an inclusive societal transition where we're all benefiting from technology and digital? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, fundamentally that systemic change will come from grassroots organisations and grassroots communities like Tech Mums that are doing the work with the local local environment, understanding what the systemic barriers are for them specifically. Um, I think some of the failures of previous programmes have been to take a kind of one paintbrush approach or one solution approach um, to uh, different regions of the UK in particular, but actually globally where there are cultural differences, there are um, kind of access barriers to infrastructure differences. So I think that, that systemic change has to come from the bottom up with support from the top down. And obviously government has been talking a lot more about um, lifelong learning and how, and how we facilitate that. Um, my question to, to them is how much of that policy is being co-created with the groups that you're trying to target. Um, and that's often the challenge that I put forward because um, you can create a system and you can create uh, a policy or, or a framework where you're looking to upskill people but unless you're talking to those end users and really trying to understand what's going to to encourage them to access that um, you're not going to get the same uptake mm -hmm. as you would if you co-created it with them. Mm -hmm. Jackie you, you, you live between the US and the UK do you see differences in how this is playing out in those two countries? So, so I think from an education curricular perspective most definitely 
Um, I think there are opportunities, and it, it's not just you. I, I think there, you know, this multidisciplinary approach to education is partly key, right? When you think about technology, technology is applied in every aspect of what you do. So how do we make sure that the curricula includes technology in every aspect of disciplines, yeah. number one? Number two, when you think about early education or even secondary education and going into universities, how are people able to to really explore mm -hmm. the different opportunities? Because, you know, I can't tell you at 16 what I'm going to be. I yeah. just can't. But if I have access to opportunity and I understand, I, you know, I, I learn about what, this, what I can be, then that gives me more opportunity. So I think that's, that's one av avenue. I think, again, US, UK, one of the things that we were doing in the US was really focusing in partnership, private public sector, mm -hmm. uh, academia, to really focus on how do you create wraparound services for young mothers, mm -hmm. for those who are low income, mm -hmm. um, still, still need to do more of that. Mm -hmm. But I think to, to Sue's point, how do we create some of these programs that understand the cultural nuances, the differences mm -hmm. to then mm -hmm. create the right outputs? And then corporations, corporations, have, have, have a unique ability yeah. and a responsibility to create alternate paths to employment. Mm -hmm. And so we need to think about those as well. And then the final is a policy. Um, again, to Florian's point, how do you make enduring policies, agile policies, that as you think about as technology evolves, policy evolves as well? Great. Well, we've just scratched the surface. There is so much more that I would like to ask our colleagues here. But I really do want to bring the audience in. So I'm going to first of all go to the room and see who'd like to contribute, because I know there are lots of people here who I would love to hear from as well as hear your questions. So, Ivana, can we come to Andrew first and then maybe bring it down the front after that? Thank you. Andrew Churchill, uh, Chairman of JJ Churchill Limited. We're a small rural manufacturer of extremely advanced gas turbine blades, only about 100 people. Founded in 1937, built on apprenticeship and I love the, th the thread that's been explored here about education because what we've found is if we don't engage with our primary schools then we haven't got a workforce inside our strap plan of seven years but what we also find is that our apprentices are generally considered failures by schools and therefore stupid and they're neither they just don't like learning facts they like solving problems and learning by doing and I think when we, when we look at the, the, the topic for tonight, I think quietly technology, manufacturing and engineering has actually been equalizing all the time, mm -hmm. but in spite of policy. And I just wonder whether simply relying on grassroots, whilst it's terribly important, is enough. I would love to see us nas nationally changing a policy approach so that we value education for learning, not just facts and not just turning out people who can sit exams because this is a massive social equaliser because we generally recruit from those who are underprivileged and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because I think our education system is failing that sector of society and I need those people. Thank you Andrew. Well I'm going to um, give get sort of quick fire responses because I want to sweep up some more questions. Who'd like to jump in? Sue? Mm. No, um, oh, no, no, you go. <laughs> um, I absolutely agree. I think our, our education system is like 50 years, 80 years out of date. I think what my parents did at, at uh, school, however, like 80 years ago, is hasn't changed very much till now. And the whole the exam system and everything. And I've got I've got four kids and three are dyslexic who were uh, by some teachers seen as stupid at school. And they're not stupid at all. You know, there's just so many things that are wrong with the education system. And absolutely, the whole memorising of facts is, is just worthless now, really. We've got the internet, whereas our education system is kind of pre-internet, so it just doesn't make sense. Florian, what would you like to add? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I work with teachers extensively, um, and some of the challenges we're seeing in, in the education system is around uh, CPD, so providing that training to teachers to be able to deliver the curriculum in a different way. Um, but there's also issues around the, the funding. Um, and I think the, the one that strikes me the most is our attitudes to vocational qualifications in comparison to the more academic routes. Um, I always say that if degree apprenticeships had been available when I would have, was going to university, I would have 100% taken, um, taken it. So one of the challenges is how do we change the perception of those vocational qualifications? Obviously, T-Levels is starting to do that, but we're recovering from a, from a period of, or of a generation who've been told that university was the only way to succeed. And so that's a narrative we have to slowly or very quickly dismantle and start to reconsider actually 
the future workforce that we need are probably people with the hands-on te technical skills. It's the technicians, not necessarily the engineers. Thank you, Florian. I, I just want to add, yeah, add yeah. to your point. This notion of immersive learning, experiential, critical thinking, mm -hmm. I mean, alternate types of learning experiences is key as well as you think about changing the curriculum in the education system. Brilliant. Uh, I think we all agree with you, Andrew. Um, I'm going to switch topics now and uh, I'm going to ask Sana at the front. And then after that, I'm going to go to the um, questions that are coming in online and then we're back to the room. So, Sana, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Sana Karagani. I am the former head of the UK's Office for AI, but I won't ask you about AI. <laughs> um, I do love that we frame this as technology, and I think that's really, really important. And sometimes we forget all the technology that everybody uses every day, right? Um, what I wanted to ask, and I've been kind of running around in my head about how to frame this properly, there's a couple of questions. One is around scale, and one's around diversity. And I feel like we can't, we haven't done either of those well. So I think um, that. I completely agree that the grassroots is the way to go. The problem with grassroots is we can't scale it fast enough to get across as many people as we need to. Um, and no matter how much we try to push from above and below and do that connection, you're absolutely right, it just doesn't work. So I wanna think about how do we scale this and how do we how do we get diversity better? We, we, we're still really la lacking in this. Like this, you know, I did computer science a number of years ago. <laughs> um, and, and it was bad then. It's just as bad now. I mean, it's interesting that it's just as bad now. It is still an all male, um, and not to mention the fact that we, we completely leave the global south out and all of the, the rest of it, but we still have like a female male problem as well. So something around scale, which is how do we get it? And the second is around diversity, which is, and I've tried to approach this. I sat in a room with a bunch of deans from a university um, and I said, on, on what planet are you allowing any student to graduate from this university without understanding how these new technologies affect their area of study? Like, I get that, you know, academia is set in silos, but on what planet are we allowing this to continue to happen? So how do we address some of these systemic problems without leaving it to government or policy? Because that takes a long time. Wow, some thorny ones there, come <laughs> to you, jump in. Um, well, I think about scaling of funding, you know, like I, I've run grassroots programs and it's been very, very difficult to scale. So for example, Tech Mums, we're actually just considering whether to shut it down because we've run out of money because the pandemic just kind of like stopped everything from happening and now we've got no funding. So we're having a conversation next week, should we shut it down or should we try again and get some funding? And it's always, it's, it's been, kind of limping along with great results for, for over 10 years now. And so lots of these, you know, it's really wonderful to hear from Florian earlier um, when we were chatting before about how STEMETS has, has become, you know, a great success. And that's really, really wonderful. And that's what I wanted for Tech Mum. So, but it's so great to see that it can happen, but it doesn't always happen. And I think also, you know, women from underprivileged backgrounds and not the kind of, I hate to use the word, but like sexiest thing for corporates to sponsor or for anyone to, to sponsor. So there are lots of ideas and it is very difficult to scale if you don't have the funding or the support. So I think funding and, and support are, are really critical for that. I um, can't remember what the other questions were. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come back to some of the bits. Yeah. J Jackie, did you want to jump well, in? Well, just with scaling, I, I, I think we need to think um, a little bit more innovative about utilizing social media for good. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we use it at scale, TikTok. We use all of these things today where our digital natives, real time, always looking at it. Why are we not capitalizing on that for learning? Mm -hmm. Why are we not capitalizing that to your point to scale? So I think maybe, you know, the onus is on us, mm -hmm. but the point is there are ways to do it. I agree funding, but there are mm -hmm. different ways of learning and different ways of consuming information. And I think we need to think about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brilliant. Um, I'm in a minute going to ask Beth, who's sitting there, if she'd like to comment on, particularly after Sue talked about um, who's supporting women from underserved groups, because I thought that you might like to say something about that. Um, but I just want to link it to a question that's come in, first of all, sort of, it's bridging out from Sana's comments. Um, so an online um, participant who hasn't given their name said, do we talk enough about how technology opens up opportunities for creativity such as digital music and video? And I don't know if some of you might have seen in The Times today uh, um, an op-ed that really was, was sort of talking about how, you know, the focus on STEM has been damaging and is, um, is undervaluing uh, creative arts subjects. And I, I personally find it really quite 
frustrating and depressing that we still juxtapose creativity and, and STEM or engineering technology. And we don't talk about the really intimate and mutually reinforcing relationship between all of these. Um, and I think if we do want society to really benefit in the round from technology, we need as much creativity within technologies as, as we can possibly get. And we need great cross collaborative working between people from all disciplines. Mm -hmm. But did any of you have any reflections on this question of how do we elevate the role technology plays in enabling creativity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think the first most basic approach is STEAM rather than STEM. Um, when I used to work with the APPG for Design and Innovation, there are so many fantastic schools based in the UK, art schools, who are doing some who are creating research at the very cutting edge of technology. And often what we end up doing, especially within the education system, is just kind of diverting people off between the arts and the sciences or humanities and the sciences. And actually, fundamentally, technology cannot be an enabler unless we have anthropologists and ethicists and people who work in the arts and humanities who can understand the second, third, fourth order impact of technology and how we live our lives. And so I think we, need to reframe the question um, slightly and think about, well, if this is where we want to end up as society mm -hmm. and this is the way in which we want to use technology, who are the people and the skills we need to, to mobilise? And actually, when you start to talk about it in that way, it would be silly to have a room or of a development team where you don't have people from those, yeah. from those backgrounds. Um, and I'm sure a lot of um, representatives from those industries will agree. And actually, I think creative industries is in some ways the easiest way for us to access the public. People engage with visual arts all the time. We engage with um, media all the time. Um, so highlighting where there's STEM principles in that is also really important. But I think um, changing that conversation and focusing on the STEAM mm -hmm. and the interactions between the two will be really critical. Brilliant. Very well said. Um, yes, please. Hi, everyone. So I'm Beth from Amazon. Um, I've spent over 15 years of my career working at that intersection of technology for good, social and environmental impact. And to, to the question of the debate around um, society's great equaliser, um, I'm going to add to the to the scale uh, a sense of urgency because best projections for climate change has got us on a kind of 10 year timeline. Worst case projections, we're looking at three years. To, to really serious kind of catastrophic events that we're going to not, not come back from. And what, what worries me is that it's the incumbent thinking that has got us to this point. Um, and so we, we talk a lot about diversity and balance, etc. But for me, it's, you know, we need different thinking. We need diversity of thought and perspective, and we need designers and influencers at the top and fast to change that incumbent thinking to really move us back from the edge and we're not talking about next generation at this point and, and I you know I'll put on the shelf all my worries being a parent and educating my, my children but um, it's this generation and this people now where I think we really need that that fast acceleration so I love the idea about social media I wonder whether part of our problem here is is branding um, and people feeling like it's almost so technical and the taxonomy is so advanced and academic that they're really struggling to engage with this uh, around real kind of simple problem solving we need to accelerate on now um, and I'm hoping you agree and I'm, I'm asking you know if there's one thing that the people in this room or people online could do to move with agency and speed around this where should we be prioritizing our time and attention brilliant where's the pace going to come from I'm going to go to you first, Jackie. Uh, I, I still believe, you know, to, to the point about urgency, I still believe that bringing together this, the, the younger generation to help drive will, will accelerate us. Burning platform, all focused on social good, all focused on climate. I mean, climate is to the point of anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, how do we harness the power of them in a diverse way to do that? So for me, that's where I would focus. Brilliant. I'm going to ask each of you for a thought on this. Go along the panel. I would say, as expected, um, funding programmes to, to help educate people in a way that works for them, to your kind of point of um, it has to be developed with the people that actually need the programme so that it's fit for purpose. A very large scale programmes across the country that, that are free that anyone could go along to. You know, so, I mean, I could do that with Tech Mums if I had the support. 
because we've got a program that works with mums. It can work with anyone. We've just kind of like focused on mums. So there are programs, and it's not just our program. There are lots of programs out there which can take people from kind of zero to hero kind of thing in terms of technology in weeks, you know, and that's like a few hours a week. It's not all, we can do it. We've got the capability, we've got the technology. <laughs> So it's working yeah. through the, the, the channels and the interventions that, that we know reach the audiences we need to. Get people collaborating together who've got the knowledge and, and are able to scale. And we could do it. I mean, we could do it. Brilliant. Um, Florian? Um, I always come back to policy because I think Jackie's point is great. Like the, the social media and young people are really focusing on these types of issues. But at the end of the day, individual action is really important. But actually, the systemic change that we're looking at to see the system changes that we're asking for, we need to incentivize businesses to do the right thing, um, to embed ethical practices in, in how they operate. Um, often that has to be through regulation, unfortunately. Um, but it, policy is kind of where we need to start and that and that needs to come from educating policymakers uh, so government parliamentarians all of all of those are really important stakeholders um to create kind of re regulatory environments where people are absolutely focused on net zero and it's not just um, a vanity metric and we're really thinking about the immediacy of the threat because i think often that gets forgotten when you're having your kind of board meetings and thinking about like the future of the business etc um and actually i think bringing young people into that um because i know people of my age generation 15 and 16 year olds who i work with who talk about mm -hmm. florian i'm really worried about the impact of net zero and and climate change I don't think I'll have kids because what world will we be living in 2040? You know, I think that's a, that's a generation that has grown up understanding the immediacy of the threat and they need to be brought into the rooms where those decisions are being made. Mm -hmm. I think Florian's point is spot on. So if you think about it, taking those younger folks digital and putting them systemically across all aspects, right, from policy to some of the other systemic things, I think is part of, part of the key here. Well, just to put a counterpoint to that, um, one of the online um, comments is that, that there's concern around the impact of increased smartphone use by young people on their mental health. And how do we balance this you know, world where we've got amazing access to all sorts of opportunities through smartphones, through social media use, but at the same time recognising there are downsides too? Um, who'd like to comment on that? <laughs> uh, we're having a 19-year-old daughter. Um, I think by talking to them about it, I mean, again, with the Tech Mums programme, our whole like, our, um, class on like, uh, keeping safe online, keeping your family safe online, is mainly about talk to your kids about what they're doing, you know, have sort of daily conversations about what they're doing, get on TikTok so that they can send you videos and you can send them videos, which is exactly what I do with my daughter. Um, because I think, you know, the, the, the difficult, the negative things happen a lot of the time because the parents don't understand what the kids are doing or aren't talking to the kids about what they're doing or are scared of what the kids are doing and just too, too frightened to, to look stupid. Or, you know, there's loads of reasons not to do it. But I think we just have to kind of jump in and encourage others to jump in and, and kind of understand what the kids today's world looks like mm -hmm. because that's, that's the way that we can help them. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a multi-pronged approach. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, yes, I think, you know, the notion of family and, f and, and parents mm -hmm. having at least been aware and apprised of what's going on is one aspect. Mm -hmm. The second is, we won't touch on AI, but we can. When you think <laughs> about data, we have a wealth of data mm -hmm. that speaks to and helps us understand what's going on with our children. That's not intrusive. It's right there right now. Mm -hmm. And you can look at that and focus on intervention programs to help. So I, I think it's multi-pronged. OK, and then just taking the other end of the spectrum, another um, contributor, Dr Fiorini, has been just talking about the perception, whether it's real or not, that with ageing populations, this becomes a barrier to digital adoption and uh, having a technologically enabled population. Um, any, any thoughts on that one, Florian? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think fundamentally, if you were to roll out a digital literacy programme, staying safe online should be the very first module and really should be focusing on those fundamentals. And organisations like Glitch um, and other charities are looking at what those best practices um, are. I think for an ageing population, again, it's that how do you pull together um, 
a, a module or a, a way of learning that's accessible to them, um, especially if you're not digitally native or haven't grown up with that technology to hand. Um, how can we do that in a way that's empathetic? How can we bring it back to the day-to-day -day use that, what I was saying at the very beginning, kind of the material way in which we engage with technology? Um, and it's, it's sometimes I, I'm a little bit concerned that we almost focus on, we, we ignore the basics and we assume that everyone has those fundamentals. Yeah. Um, and you wouldn't do that if you were teaching physics or any other advanced technology. <laughs> so we should do the same for digital literacy. Absolutely. And then if we sort of flip this on its head and say, well, where are the radical opportunities to use technology in a disruptive way that really, really shifts the, the, you know, the, the leading edge of progress in terms of creating more equal society. So I know, Jackie, for example, you've mentioned gamification you know, as, a, as a route to really different ways of learning or how do we use VR to really get at this issue of bias that we know, you know continues to be a, a challenge across society. What, what are the big opportunities there that we haven't seized yet? Jackie, I want to start with you. Yeah, I have to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the big opportunities? Well, if anyone else has got the answer while Jackie's thinking, yeah. then feel free to jump in. <laughs> well, I've, I can chat about it a bit. But um, because my mum-in-law's now 81 and um, can't get out so easily. And so I've been trying to come up with creative ways to make her life better. And I think there, there's so many opportunities because even with very basic digital skills, being able to FaceTime someone, you can connect people together who, who can't get out, for example. Um, and, you know, there's so much that we could be doing at scale to create little communities of people that care about the same thing. You know, we could have people going around to, um, to people's homes and helping them get online. So it's doing kind of the basic stuff so they know how to do a Zoom call or, or FaceTime. Um, and then help them to get into groups of other people and like maybe do a regular call together and discuss whatever it is they're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, so I think always, particularly with people that aren't comfortable with technology, the way to help them get to grips with it is to think of something that they are really interested in already. So like, yeah. I don't know, gardening or cricket or that's very middle class options. <laughs> but, or, Other or, interests are available. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but find something they're interested in and yeah. then kind of like help them in that way. But we, you know, we could do that at scale. We've, we've got people who've got all the knowledge mm -hmm. to be able to do that. We've got structures, infrastructure that we could use, but we're just not doing it. Great, one concrete idea already. I, I saw a great one on, on CNN yesterday um, about, I think it was Jamil Research Lab in Kenya yeah. in partnership with the University of Edinburgh, focused on vulnerable communities in the world where climate change has had a major impact. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the mobility things that we can think of to move um, pe people around right. and anticipate the drought, etc.? I thought that was fascinating. Mm -hmm. And just think about that at scale. Mm -hmm. When you think about all the things globally and the effect mm -hmm. of climate change, what that can do. Yeah. Um, I, I thought that was, so that one was radical great. for me. Okay, great. Uh, Florian, what's, what's your example? Um, yeah, it's really niche interest that I've started building, but I think kind of block, blockchain and supply chain, um, I think that's a really interesting example where we can um, really look at the distribution of wealth across supply chains, particularly for precious metals and materials that we rely on, on our day -to -day, for our day-to-day -day lives and technology. Um, I think it's a really interesting area where it's starting to prove um, incentivize businesses to have best practice because now everything is traceable, um, but also challenging our perception of the value of, of the work of sorry the value of the material transfer from the very first kind of order suppliers down to um, the, the system integrators, and I think that's also being kind of disrupted almost as it's disrupting because then you start to think about well actually will blockchain be secure if we're in the world of quantum? So it's kind of how do these um, con convergence of technologies all have an impact? These these are some of the questions we should be asking ourselves because I think it fundamentally changes how we do businesses, how mm. companies operate and how they deliver value. Um, I think that's just a really Great. niche example. No, three really different examples. Brilliant. Well, we've got loads of other people in the audience who I know have interesting comments to make, so or questions. So I'm going to go back to the room for a minute. Um, who'd like to offer a question or comment? Yes, please, sorry. Okay. Just one second, we'll wait for the microphone. Thank you. Thank you for the conversation so far. My name is Laura. You have touched already a little bit on sustainability, diversity, ethics, and AI. How do we think about this globally, particularly on the global south? Mm -hmm. Because if we have 40% of people in the UK that don't have access to digital, the reality for the global south is way worse. So the only way we're really going to talk about 
equality is if we're bringing the Global South with us, and I'm Costa Rican, so I'm interested. would love to hear your thoughts about that. Great. I'm really glad we've, we've got the Global South into this discussion. It's incredibly important. Um, Florian, I'm looking at you because you, you look quite ready for this question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm still thinking, but um, yeah, no, I think, I think it's a really interesting conversation. Um, I think it's quite boring that we always talk about net zero and it's always about the kind of impact of net zero on, on the kind of global norm. Um, I think there are, there are three kind of key things, always in threes, but three kind of th key things that we should be looking at. Um, first is kind of the impact of net zero, or sorry, the impact of climate change on the global south has already arrived. So we also need to think about how the impact of what we're doing and kind of waste we send to the global south or, or, or actually the fact that we generate a lot of the carbon consumption, but the impact is being felt by people who don't. And um, that needs to be in conversations, whether that's diplomacy, whether it's about policy, whether it's within the UN, those convening groups that bring together those those organisations need to have re really honest conversations about that impact and who is liable for, to, to, to kind of pay for the repercussions of it. I think secondly, there's an interesting point around um, the social media and kind of people who, are, who, who have those conversations and who curate those conversations. Go and look beyond your community go and look to young people from those areas who are galvanising on social media, as we've spoken before. Um, that's really key. And I think the third one that um, is quite concerning to me is kind of, again, that kind of su supply chain, kind of best practice ethics. Are we really thinking about um, the transfer of value across supply chains, not just in manufacturing, in pretty much any sector? Um, and kind of workers who are, who are working in those environments, are they being paid fairly? Are they getting, um, or are they receiving, are they working in the right conditions? Um, so I think some of those conversations are a lot more difficult to have, a lot more political, uh, but we need to be having them. The policymakers need to be aware of them and need to re realise the kind of impact of their decisions, not just on their citizens, but with the organisations and the nations that they want to cooperate with. And I think that's something we have to um, almost normalise because it's still quite taboo, but I absolutely agree with you. I, I think we see more with things like COP, et cetera, we see more tight, tightly coupled collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I think we need more of that. So, you know, I touched on this Kenya, Edinburgh collaboration, more pan collaboration is needed with NGOs at the core, because I think NGOs can play a key role in enabling, highlighting, galvanizing and scaling. So uh, for me, that is, it's the systemic approach is where I, I think would be really good. Great, and I would also just add that I think it can be easy to underestimate the extent to which the Global South is already deploying digital technology, mobile telephony, for extraordinary societal and economic development purposes that honestly, because we have all this legacy infrastructure in countries like the UK, we've got no imperative and perhaps don't have the creativity to, um, to think of. So uh, there are a whole range of examples and you know on, on Thursday we have our Africa Prize for Engineering Innovation final. Year after year I'm blown away by the extent to which African innovators that we meet through that process are already doing things that have yes local impact but are highly scalable and the the networks that exist that might not be visible to us sitting in the UK um, are, um, are actually really powerful and, and, and tapping into those and learning from those I think is one of the ways in which we can hopefully get at the answer to this question. The time is flying. Um, <laughs> we've got another question here, and then I think we're going to have to move towards final thoughts, please. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ishreen Bradley from Belonging Pioneers. Florian, you've mentioned policy a few times, and, and that, that's the way forward. I've just come from a meeting with Kemi Badenoch, where she's sort of saying we're not going to mandate things. We don't want to uh, regulate too much, you know? So my question is, a, how do we encourage the current government in regards to policy formulation? And her other point was, well, you know, ESG is working really well because the private sector is driving it. So what can we do in this space to encourage the private sector to do more? Two very big and important questions. Yeah. Um, so, Florian, you were name-checked in this, so I feel I should start <laughs> with you and work, work back That's across you. the panel. Um, no, I think, I think it's a really interesting point. Policy is not the, the start and end of the conversation nor the solution. Um, I think one of the really important parts is the co-creation of policy. Um, so pulling those people in together. Um, so bringing industry, academia, third sector, NGOs, et cetera, et cetera, into that conversation. I think we have to be realistic um, about how government operates. It's a churning machine. It's very slow. 
uh, politicians are in and out the door, as we've seen. So we can't rely on them, obviously, but they've also got really difficult jobs. So if we look at AI and kind of the differing AI um, acts and bills and laws that are uh, that globally are, are trying to essentially regulate the same market, um, there's got to be a lot more collaboration. And um, that I always go back to that point because I think so many conversations are being had in silos. The duplication is why we're having the challenges that we are. Um, but I also think we have to have a conversation about the um, environment in which those companies operate. We're still incentivized to make profit at the end of the day. Um, and until we kind of challenge that, um, I think we're going to really struggle to incentivize businesses to behave differently. Um, I know that's a little bit controversial, but I think those are the kind of difficult conversations that need to be had outside of the policymakers and outside of the kind of churn of government and the day to day because they have to deliver public services first and foremost. Um, and that's where I look to organisations like trade bodies, trade associations who have that convening power to present, represent a voice for different sectors. And that's really important. Um, but I absolutely agree with you. Policy is not the be all and end all and politicians are not going to solve all of our problems. Um, Sue, what would you like to add to that? I think so the thing I don't understand, and, I, and maybe I never will understand it, is why we're not solving the problems. Because, you know, even from this conversation here, we can tell that between even us in this room, we know enough people to be able to sort this out in a way, but we just can't make it happen. Um, and I suppose, you know, having been in education and technology and technology education changing my life, that's always my kind of answer to everything. I think maybe sort of like a one track record. Um, but, um, you know, I believe that if we empower individuals to understand technology to a certain level, uh, then those individuals, and lots of them work in companies, and so that empowers the, the organisation. And then those companies there within a country, and so that empowers the whole country. Just why aren't we doing all of this? We could do it in a very basic way, which wouldn't cost a load of money. Um, and we could help kind of upskill everyone to just even be able to understand reality, like modern day reality, which I think if you're, if you're not interacting in the way that we probably are online and, and uh, seeing what's out there in the world and be able to kind of like critically analyse um, the things that we see and hear, the more that everyone's got the ability to do that, the, the kind of all of these problems I think will be much easier to solve. Thank you. Before Jackie, you answer it. I'm going to squeeze in one additional one um, question that's coming online because it's, it, it relates to the second part of the question uh, about companies. So this person hasn't given their name, but they say, what about the potential downsides of the monopoly huge companies have on key technologies and the power this gives a tiny margin to society at the top of those companies? So we started off talking at um, Florian's opening remarks, referenced power within this discussion. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. So, and then I'm going to give you a heads up that you'll all have a chance to make a final comment to leave the audience with, a final pearl of wisdom or an ask, an action point. Well, I, I think for the former question, um, the world is, a, is an interesting place and um, we need a burning platform. You, know, you saw it with the pandemic, burning platform, everybody rallied because there was a common issue. I think I'm hopeful that climate change, natural disasters, will help people understand that you can't operate if you're flooded. You can't operate mm -hmm. in an environment like this. So I'm hopeful, optimistic, that burning, this burning platform will start to raise a consciousness that we never had before. Because without that, I'm not very hopeful. Um, on the monopoly side, um, I think what you've started to see are large companies engaging in ways that they never did before. Um, if you look in the US and you, you saw at the Department of Justice, you saw major corporations getting engaged, mm -hmm. starting to inform, starting to scare, but also recognizing the importance of the role that they play and also recognizing somewhat of the monopoly. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Um, so. I'd love to hear from you each, just a final takeaway for the audience. Um, I'm going to start with you again, Florian. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think one of the really interesting things when we talk about technology is this kind of uh, robots are going to take over the world if they continue. And I think actually, if we ever get to that point, it's because of a series of decisions that humans have made compounding on each other, and whether that's on purpose or accidentally. And I, and I guess my kind of call to arms is if we embed 
equity, justice, inclusion, all the things we've talked about today, at the heart of our decision making, that reframes how we look at technology. So rather than it being a thing that we deploy, it becomes a tool that we use to live our lives. Um, and it kind of speaks to then net zero, climate change, all of these, all of these problems that we've talked about today. Um, and so I think fundamentally, yes, it can be an, an enabler and an equaliser, but only if we as humans employ it in the right way and we use a set of guiding principles that are um, kind of comprehensive and based in compassion and based in ethics. And that, I know it sounds all rainbows and daisies and, and whatnot, <laughs> but I think whenever anyone asks me, you know, are robots going to take over the world? And, well, yes, if we let it. Um, and we're only going to let it if we don't keep our eye on the ball and we don't use those principles to, to guide us. Thank you, Florian. See your final thoughts. Everything Florian said, plus, <laughs> plus, I mean, plus kind of what I was just saying in terms of the answers are out there. You know, there, there's so many people that know all different sorts of things about how to solve problems in, in different ways with different, um, coming from different perspectives. So I think collaboration is key um, in solving the problems that we've got around us. And, and again, education and particularly just helping people to understand reality, because I think a lot of people don't and that's that's there's a big problem there because they don't actually understand what's going on in the world thank you sue jackie everything that they said <laughs> <laughs> with the final thought of um our moral compass as a society what is it how do we drive that how do we make sure we have one mm -hmm. um i think that that is that is the the root of really getting at how we change society fantastic well um we chose quite an ambitious topic and I'm not saying we got to every corner of it <laughs> but I think we had a really good exploration of some of the key th themes that underpin the sort of the basis for the optimism that we all started off with at the start and I suppose what I take away from this is it is a complex topic it can feel overwhelming but actually we know what good looks like we've learned a lot about how to do things to make sure we we use that agency that we do have and to support and empower people who don't necessarily feel or have that agency now. We have true burning platforms in the form of you know, global challenges, not least climate change. So perhaps we already are further along the path of at least getting the ingredients together to create a more equal society through engineering and technology than we sometimes might feel this case. And at this academy, our overarching goal is harnessing the power of engineering to build a sustainable society and an inclusive economy that works for everyone. So this is, this is not a topic just for tonight. <laughs> this is not just for Christmas. <laughs> this is what we live every day. And um, we have a whole range of activities that, that we, we run to try and support and deliver against that impact, ranging from um, Culture Plus, which is a new platform to support startups and scale-ups and embedding um, equity, diversity, inclusion into their organisation from the outset through to the Africa Prize for Engineering Innovation, which I mentioned earlier, which, as I said, the final is on Thursday, through to our Engineering X programme, a collaboration with Lloyd's Register Foundation, where we try and bring together expert communities to tackle those big global challenges of our age and to do so in a way that is truly inclusive. So if you've enjoyed this event, then please do go and have a look at the website. Um, I'd also love it if you just take a moment to um, give us some feedback. There should be, again, another QR code for a feedback survey popping up now. It will take you no longer than three minutes, <laughs> I am assured, and we really appreciate your feedback. And if you're interested in learning more about the technologies which are shaping our world, then we have a critical conversation series on LinkedIn Live, and we're going to be running through a whole range of, of key technology, starting with quantum, on the 26th of July. So um, go and find that on our events page. Um, and you can, of course, follow us on Twitter at Orange News or LinkedIn. But I think for now, my final job is to give our, thank, our, our, our thanks and appreciation to our speakers for managing to cover so much ground in such an articulate and thoughtful way. Can you join me in thanking them, please? Brilliant. Well, um, with apologies to those online, if you're in the room, there are drinks next door. <laughs> I hope everyone online has a great evening too. Thank you very much.